Chapter 7, Probability in Samples, The Distribution of Sample Means, Part 1. The learning outcomes or objectives for this chapter are as follows. We're going to define a distribution of sample means. Recall that in one of the previous lecture videos, I mentioned that we were transitioning from using a distribution of x values or scores into a distribution of sample means. And the reason for this is that it is unlikely and uh, not very constructive to conduct research using one data point. One score does not give us an indication that the manipulation of the independent variable or the comparison of a quasi-independent variable is um, effective. Therefore, we use samples to draw conclusions about populations. So we're moving towards a distribution of sample means opposed to a distribution of x values or scores. We're going to be able to describe a distribution by its shape, expected value, and standard error. The shape of the distribution will be normal. Um, we learned in the previous chapter that applying concepts of probability are only applicable when we have a distribution that's symmetrical or normal in shape. So again, normal meaning this bell curve. The expected value is in reference to the mean of a distribution of sample means. So again, the expected value is in reference to the mean of a distribution of sample means. And the standard error is the equivalent of standard deviation, but applicable to a distribution of sample means. So to review, standard deviation is the average difference between scores in a distribution and the mean of that distribution. Now that we're moving into a distribution of sample means, you may be able to guess what standard error represents. And I'll give you a second to think about it again when we're talking about a distribution of x values. Let me just draw this again. We have the mu in the center and we have an x value and all these different possible x values. And standard deviation is representing the difference as an average. So we recognize that each x value is different from the mean a certain amount. Standard deviation is the average of all those differences. So now that we're moving into a distribution of sample means, now we're plotting the mu of a population, and we're taking a sample and calculating the mean. That's an m value. And then we may get another sample mean, another sample mean, another sample mean. And based on the location of those sample means, we see that they're not the same as the mu. So we would expect some difference. and if we took all those differences and calculated um, the average, that is what standard error represents. So by definition, standard error represents the average difference between sample means and the population mean. So again, conceptually the same as standard deviation, but uh, slightly different because now we're talking about the location and differences between m values and mu opposed to x values and mu. We're going to describe the location of a sample mean um, by using a z-score. So in the past, we, we, we learned that z is equal to x minus mu divided by standard deviation. So in this chapter, z, and I'll introduce the equation, but we'll talk more about it later, is the sample mean minus mu divided by the notation for standard error, which is um, lowercase Greek sigma sub m. So this is our new equation, and again, it's going to help us understand the location of a sample mean in relation to the center of the distribution, which is re represented by the mu, or the, what we'll learn as uh, representative of the mean of means. And then finally, we'll be able to determine the probability corresponding to sample mean using z-scores. So just like we did with scores, what's the probability above a particular score, or below a score, between scores, we're going to apply that, those same skills to um, understanding the location of a sample mean in relation to the mean of means or population mean in the center. And we're going to utilize the unit normal table to do this just as we did in chapter 6. And these are the tools that we'll need. Again, you'll see that everything is cumulative. Things that we learned in the previous chapter help us learn the material in the new chapter. So we're going to have to um, 
demonstrate mastery and understanding of random sampling. Again, by definition, that refers to sampling with replacement. And more detailed explanation of that would be as follows, that each individual in the population has an equal chance of being selected. And then second, the probability of being selected stays constant from one selection to the next when more than one individual is selected. So again, if you're selecting a sample, one, every time you select one individual, that individual must be put back into the selection process so that they are um, able to be selected again or multiple times. And therefore, we understand that the denominator of our equation for probability will remain the same after each selection. So again, we summarize that concept as referring to this process as sampling with replacement. And that's important when we are engaging in probability, when we are using samples um, to draw conclusions about populations. We're going to also need um, our, an understanding of probability in the normal distribution. Essentially, how do we use the unit normal table to um, make predictions regarding probability or the chances of something occurring? And again, as I, I noted just a minute ago, our equation for calculating z for, for an x value will be um, necessary to learn how to convert a sample mean into a z-score. So now the new equation is sample mean minus the population mean over the standard error. And we'll talk more about all of these variables as we move along through chapter 7. So again, our understanding of inferential statistics is, is basically taking samples, representative samples, and exposing them to some kind of treatment unless we're using a quasi-independent variable that creates our different groups such as males, females. Um, but we are most likely not using all individuals in a population, so we're using samples to say something about a population. So when we expose a sample to a treatment, um, then we want to look at the end results. What is the average of that sample in relation to what the untreated population average looks like? So the location of a score in a sample or in a population can re re be represented by a z-score, as we learned in Chapter 6. Actually, in Chapter 5, that's when we learned how to calculate z-scores. So again, we're going to use that information to then apply it to this concept of where does this sample mean reside in the population of sample means or the distribution of sample means. Again, as I stated earlier, researchers typically want to study entire samples rather than a single score. It wouldn't make sense, again, this is our x value, it wouldn't make sense to um, test out the, uh, the effects of a new drug on one person. Um, let's say it's an antidepressant drug. We don't want to just take one individual that suffers from depression and administer this new drug. That would be ineffective. We want a sample of individuals who suffer from depression to see how it it um, affects a group that is essentially representing the larger population. So sample provides the estimate of the population. Again, we can think of it as a mini population so that we can then draw conclusions about populations. If it works a certain way with a the sample, then we can um, infer that the same would be applicable to the population. The tests involve transforming sample mean to a z-score. So again, as I stated before, we're taking the m value, subtracting the mu of the population, also refer to the mean of means, and we'll see how those, those values are equivalent in subsequent slides, and then divide by standard error. So whenever we're dividing by something, we're expressing it in, in that particular um, unit. So with the transformation of a score, we took x minus mu divided by standard deviation. If we divide by standard deviation, then we're expressing that value, um, that mathematical value, the quotient, as standard deviation units. So now, when we divide by standard error units, then we're expressing that distance from the mean and standard error units. Again, conceptually the same, but the, the specifics of these um, variables is slightly different because now we're working with sample means m value. So again, m is equal to average of a sample. In chapter one, we were introduced to this concept referred to as sampling error. Error does not indicate a mistake 
when we are taking information from a population. By definition, sampling error refers to the natural discrepancy um, between the sample statistic and the population parameter. In other words, we do not expect samples means to be identical to the population mean. Um, here's a quick example. Let's say that the average age of Southwestern College is 23. So the average age is 23. And I take my first um, online section, section 501, and I calculate the average age of that section. And let's just say it's equal to 24. And my second mean, the average of my 502 section, and let's say that average age is equal to 21. And then my third online section, and I calculate the average age for that particular class, and let's say it's 22. Now notice that 24 is different from 23, as 21 is different, and 22 is different. And if we were to plot them, 24 would be over here, 22 would be to the left, and 21 would be to the left as well. So we see that they're not all equal to the mu. So the mu is equal to 23. They're slightly different, but because they're different doesn't imply that some error has been made. It's just the, the um, natural discrepancy that we would anticipate when we take a sample, recognizing that the sample does include all values in the population. So we refer to that as sampling error. And um, we need to understand, again, that um, the majority of scores of a sample means are going to be concentrated around 23 because that's what the population is made up of. And so if we take sample after sample after sample, most of those sample means are going to be congregated around the mean of the population. And then we'll see some that are different. But again, anything that's different from the mean doesn't imply an error. Sampling error refers to, again, the natural discrepancy between the sample statistic and the population parameter, the sample mean in comparison to the population mean. Samples are, are variable. Two samples are very, very rarely identical. So again, I can take sample after sample. I could take my colleagues' um, average age of their classroom. I can take all of these samples, and it would be rare that the average would be identical. Um, so again, Sample means will differ from each other, and sample means will differ from the population mean. So again, to, just to summarize, samples differ from each other. Again, we're talking about, let's say, sample 1, let's say section 501. The, the sublabel is just a, a name for that sample. Sample 2, and then sample 3, right? It's unlikely that these samples will all be the same. Um, sample means differ from each other, as I just said, and they differ from the population mean. But our goal is to determine if the difference is noticeably different, right? Are, is my sample mean way out in the tail? Is it noticeably different from the population mean? Um, that's what we want to determine, and that's what we're going to use probability to um, answer that question. Is this value noticeably different? And then we want to determine is it noticeably different due to chance? It's just by chance that um, a, my certain section had a much larger average age than the others in, in comparison to the population? Or is it due to, in this case, the quasi-independent variable, the makeup of these different sections? Or it could be due to the drug that was administered if we're talking about testing the effectiveness of the antidepressant drug. So again, this is where we're moving. We're going to um, first understand that just because a sample mean is different from the population mean, that doesn't mean that something is happening, and it doesn't mean that an error has occurred. So we need to first understand sampling error, the definition of that, and then move towards, well, is it different because of chance, or is it different because something's happening um, due to the independent variable or the quasi-independent variable? So again, the distribution of sample means, right, this is what we're, we are working with now. Instead of a distribution of x values, which we have been working with thus far and looking at the relationship of those x values to the mean or the center, we're working with a distribution of sample means. So we take sample 1, sample 2, sample 3, 
sample four or sample five, whatever um, number of possible samples that are available. So the distribution of sample means is a collection of sample means for all the possible, all possible random samples of a particular sample size that can be obtained from a population. Now we should recognize that this is, we're moving into theoretical um, situations because it would be unlikely to construct all possible random samples of a population. But I will walk you through one example of a very small population. We'll, we'll calculate the mean of all possible sample means and then um, understand the distribution in terms of its shape, the expected value of M um, with, within this distribution of sample means and also what the standard error represents when we construct this new distribution. So again, this slide just summarizes things that I've already said and it's prepping us for this example of taking a small population, constructing all the possible samples, and then computing the mean of all possible samples. So the distributions in earlier chapters were distribution of scores. Again, when we say score, we mean x values from samples. The distribution of sample means is called a, distribu uh, a sampling distribution. The distribution of sample means is a special kind of population. So again, now we're constructing a population of m values of sample means. It is a distribution of sample means obtained by selecting all possible samples of specific sample size from a population. Again, theoretically, we accept these concepts um, and they have been proven prob um, in mathematically. We, we don't need to um, agonize over all of the possibilities, we just accept theoretically that this is true. And the reason it's true is if we take all, and, and what I say what is true is that, um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, the average of sample means equals mu, and that's an essential component of this new distribution of sample means. And we um, were exposed to this in the previous chapter um, when we were talking about standard deviation. So we're going to walk through an example where we take all possible samples, compute sample means, and see that it is equal to the population mean and that we are constructing a whole new distribution of um, values and those values are m values, the mean of samples versus x values that we were working with in the previous chapter. So figure 7.1 um, refers to a distribution of scores, and the scores in this distribution are equal to 2, 4, 6, and 8. And we see that they all have an occurrence of 1 based on the frequency. So it's a very small sample oh, population. So again, this is a population of four scores. And now using those four scores, we're going to take all the possible samples all the common different possible combinations of how these scores can be selected and then we're going to compute the mean of those samples and then construct a distribution of sample means. So if we say our samples are going to be equivalent to two scores, now I'm going to show you all the possibilities of samples when n is equal to two, n being the size of a sample. So in table 7.1, we have all of the different possible samples. So here, again, we had original x values. We had a population of six scores, and those scores are 2, 4, 6, and 8. And this column here shows how many samples, how many possible samples are um, derived from this population of six scores. So the first, so again, here are the scores. So if we randomly select a score in the first score, these are x values, is 2, and the second value is 2. If we take the mean of that sample, so again, all samples are equal to two scores. So sample 1, first score selected was 2. Sec again, we were working with um, sampling with replacement, so that score is put back into the, into the mix, and it's selected the second time, so we have a sample now. So sample 1 consists of x is equal to 2 and x is equal to 2. And then the third column is the calculation of the average of those two scores. So again, our 
<clears throat> excuse me, our m is equal to the sum of x over n. So m is equal to 2 plus 2 is 4, divide by how many scores I had, which was 2, and I get a mean equal to 2. And we do that for all possible samples. So my second sample, my first x value is equal to 2, and my second x value is equal to 4, and then I calculate the mean of that sample of two scores. So 2 plus 4 is 6, divided by 2, and I get a sample mean of 3. And we do that for all possible samples get from a population of the original six scores. Okay, so that's how we're coming up with these averages in this last column. These are all the sample means for all possible samples of two scores for this original population of four scores. I'm sorry, I keep saying six, and I, and I just realize I'm probably confusing you. I've made a mistake. The population size is equal to four, and I'll have to go back and check it. Um, and see what I had um, indicated before. I'm sorry about that. So the population is equal to four scores. We have four original scores in the population, not six. And we're constructing samples all this, um, in the size of two scores. So that's why lowercase n is equal to two. Okay, so now that I've corrected that error, we'll focus on this last column, which again is the, the distribution of sample means. And now we're going to graph these sample means. So I'm going to flip between this and, and the um, figure 7.2, which is the distribution of sample means, to show you how we're constructing this new distribution. So our first sample mean, M1, is equal to 2. That's this score here. And M2 is equal to 3. That's the second um, average from our sam second sample, and so on and so forth. So let's go back to our graph to see what we're doing with these values here. But before we do that, let's just see how many sample averages are equal to 2. And we see that it's just 1. Let's see how many are equal to 3. So we have um, 1 here, 2, and I believe that's it. Let's just do four so that we can get a sense of what we're looking at. There's one, and then two, three, and we'll start there. So again, we have one sample average of two, we have two sample averages equal to three, and three sample averages equal to four. So again, here's the original distribution with a population. I'm glad to see that I wrote four correctly here, so I had four scores. And this is what the original distribution of the population looked like with those four scores. Now, what we've done here is constructed a distribution of sample means where the sample size was equal to 2. And again, notice what we had um, concluded looking at that last column. There was one sample that had an average of 2. That's this one here. And we had two samples that were equal to three, and we had three samples that were equal to four. And if we go back to the list, we'll see that we have one, two, three, four. And we'll confirm that in just a second, that we have four samples that um, had an average equal to five. So again, what we're doing is taking those sample averages and now constructing this new distribution. So each of these boxes, each of these boxes, Right, is a sample mean. Okay, so sample mean one, right, and then we have our other samples. So this is the creation of a distribution of all possible samples from a population where the population was equal to four scores, a very small population. So you can imagine what all the possible samples would look like if our population was equal to 20,000 overwhelming, right? And so that's why we think of this, theoretically, this is uh, what we would expect, that if we take all possible samples from a distribution of a, a population, we can construct a distribution of sample means, and there are certain characteristics that will um, arise from this new distribution. So if we go back to this table, and um, the next sample mean was equal to 5, so you have 1, two, three, and four. Four um, sample means equal to five. 
and then the next um, score a sample mean of six that occurs one two three times so we can see where these values are coming from again we're, we're taking these sample means and then graphing them on a distribution and creating this new distribution of sample means so again the sample mean equal to five we see that it had one two three four occurrences sample mean of six and I should use the same color that I use for five one two three four and then we had sample mean equal to six and it occurred three times and we could do that for the sample mean of seven and eight but what we see now the characteristics that I referred to is that what is the shape of this distribution the shape of a distribution of sample means will be normal there are some other criteria that we have to adhere to but here we're taking all the possible samples creating a distribution of sample means and that distribution will be normal if the distribution the original population distribution was normal and if our sample size is um, greater than 30 so we don't have to meet both criteria if, in other words if the original population is normal the distribution of sample means will be normal if the original population distribution is skewed then as long as n is greater than 30 the distribution of sample means will be normal and I will explain this um, more or, or refer to it more in subsequent slides so again now we see the distribution is is um, normal now what I want to talk about is the mean of means so the mean mean of sample means but before we do that let's go back to the original population distribution and calculate the mean of that population so here's the original population of scores and we have four scores and so if we want to calculate mu mu is equal to the sum of x over n so if we add these scores together so we have um, 2 plus 4 so 2 plus 4 that's 6 and then plus 6 is 12 plus 8 is 20 and we divide by how many scores we have in the population which is equal to 4 so mu is equal to 5 so the population average of this distribution is equal to 5 now visually looking at the distribution of sample means what do you think the mean of the sample mean of, of um, sample means is equal to I'll give you a second to think about that and if you conclude that the notation for the mean of mean looks like this if you said 5 you're correct because again our understanding of a normal distribution the mean would be in the center of that distribution but now what I want to do is actually calculate what the average or the mean of all sample means is equal to okay so we want to calculate the mean of sample means so the mean of sample means the average of all possible samples so we're going to take the sum of all sample means and divide by number of samples okay so we know right now that the number of samples is equal to 16 right we had all possible samples we had 16 possible samples so now what we need to get the numerator of our equation is take the summation of all the sample means that we calculated so we have 16 samples 16 sample means and now we're going to take the summation of all of these so I'll give you a moment to calculate the sum of this column so the sum of all of these values so the sum of all our sample means and we should get you can pause this for a second um, to make sure that you're doing this correctly to, to confirm we're on the same page and if we take the summation of all those possible sample means all 16 of them we get 80 so we get the sum of all sample means equal to 80 so 80 divided by 16 will give us the mean of sample means and we should get a value equal to 5 and so what we've 
just been able to do is, is confirm that this the mean of sample means will equal mu. So the mean of sample means will always equal the population mean. And the reason is because all of these possible samples are coming from the original population. So each sample, in and we take all possible samples, are made up of all the original x values. So it should make sense that if we average all possible sample means, that the average of those sample means would equal the population mean. And we just affirmed this with this small population of four scores. So visually, again, you probably concluded that the mean of sample means would equal 5 because it's in the center. It has the highest peak. It's also the mode and the median. And now we've mathematically confirmed that the mean of means is equal to mu because the, the previous slide um, where I showed the population of four scores, we calculated the actual mu and it was equal to 5. So when we, you hear this concept of expected value of m, that's in reference to what we anticipate the mean of sample means to equal and in most cases mu will be given mu will be given and we recognize that if mu is given then we know what the mean of sample means is equal to and the mean of sample means is the same as the expected value so just a kind of a preview of, of the concepts that we'll be um, dealing with. And again, going back to the learning objectives, one of the things that we needed to learn to do is describe a distribution of sample means in terms of its shape and expected value. So now we, we have been introduced to two of those elements. Um, the third element was the standard error. So the shape will be normal and um, the expected value would be equal to the population mean. The expected value again is in reference to the mean of sample means and we know now that it will always equal the population mean. Now the shape again there are two things that we had to um, be conscientious of. Is the original population um, distribution normal and then if not what is the magic number that n must equal the sample size for it to be normal. So again, we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but before we move on, let's go back to the original distribution. Now, what's the shape of this distribution? It doesn't look like the normal peaked um, bell shape, but it still would be considered normal. It still is a normal distribution. And again, we had identified that 5 was representative of the mu of this population distribution. So just to summarize um, some characteristics of the distribution of sample means, the sample means pile up around the population mean. So again, if we go back to that slide, we did see that most of the scores were in the center of the distribution. The distribution of sample means is approximately normal in shape. And again, I said that um, it will be normal if the original population distribution is normal. or if n is greater than 30. So you just have to adhere to one of these requirements. If the original population is normal, your sample size can be any size. And here we saw with that example, n was equal to 2, much lower than 30. But since the original population was normal, then our distribution of sample means was normal. If the original distribution is skewed, then n must be greater than 30 to produce a normal distribution of sample means. So as long as n is greater than 30, the distribution of sample means from original population that is skewed will be normal. And again, we will discuss this in, um, in more detail and look at examples in subsequent slides. So this concludes part one of chapter seven. In the, in the next chapter, I'll talk about some more um, terminology, such as the central limit theorem and the law of large numbers, and go into more detail about the standard error of the mean and what it represents and how we calculate it.